So Huawei is ahead in 5G right now, you know, substantially, arguably. And so, so what does America do? What does you know Europe do? What's your, what's your? Idea? Yeah, well, you have to go back to um, what I said about the the network being for machines, and um, and then realize that everything, every decision we've made in technology to this point has been for resiliency, connectivity, and speed. Everything. And then afterwards, when people started hacking into things, we thought, oh, we need to add some security on top of that. Well, if you're, if you're, if you're at your foundational design decision, you say, I'm going to compromise security so they can have speed, resiliency, and connectivity. Now you've got a problem in that any security you apply it's thereafter just a is just a past job yeah. and is going to um, ultimately fail. And so what my study said was, in addition to, hey, we need to, how can we uh, jump ahead of uh, China in 5G? We need to go back, reverse every one of those decisions. Since 5G is going to be such a proliferated technology, in other words, you're going to have connectivity just about everywhere if it's deployed correctly. We don't have to worry about all these design decisions we made in the past about re resiliency, speed, and connectivity, that's already built into the network. Okay, let's go back and then the underlying compute network power um, uh, interface technology, all of those design decisions, let's go back and let's des design them from the ground up to be secure. Now, fortunately, all of this work is done in, in American companies and universities and in research labs. All it takes is for somebody to come together and put them together in a way that essentially fundamentally redesigns the internet. The internet was designed to be very mappable, to be very open, to be easily deciphered. That is not good if you want to actually have uh, to secure your data. In other words, we would never allow Chinese tanks to be rolling down 435 on an afternoon in DC. We just wouldn't allow it to happen. Right. So why do we allow the PLA to essentially roam our networks uh, without license? Because we have no way to stop them because we didn't design the network to prevent them to, from doing so. If you think about Alexander Hamilton when he was thinking about the country and you know we need an army, we need a navy, he, was, he understood, he didn't even think about space, he was thinking about air, sea, land, you know, we added space later. We completely created this digital environment. It's totally man-made, but we've never thought about how in a, in, a, in a societal sense, in a governance sense, how do we actually control that in a way that presents the same kind of values that the American people have, uh, have uh, come to grow and love over 240 years. You have to actually design that in the technology. You can't go and add a, an amendment to the Constitution and say, well, we want an internet that actually doesn't behave like the Wild West and allows all our adversaries to come in and influence us or take our uh, intellectual property. You can't do that. You actually have to design it in the technology. And so that requires leadership by the government. Right now, we, we um, are essentially abdicating that leadership to the private sector. The private sector just wants to build the, pre the cheapest network so it can make profits on uh, all the connectivity. And so our system currently doesn't incentivize a completely secure internet for the American people because we haven't yet essentially adapted or come to the uh, realization that if we don't, then all of these precious uh, freedoms that we've, uh, that we've uh, grown to uh, know and love and cherish will just be taken from us, not because you know, somebody's gonna come in and invade with an army, because we're going to, it, they're slowly going to be eroded because our ability to understand what's going on is really going to be masked from us because your phone knows more about you than you could even imagine. Now, where does that data go? That, that data goes essentially to the highest bidder. Think about this. The Second Amendment. The Second Amendment provides American citizens with the right to resist the government if it ever becomes oppressive. Now, if you live in a world where you don't know that you're being oppressed or you don't know who's oppressing you, what good is a gun? Fascinating, Rob. Tell me, 
the people say that the China or the Chinese Communist Party is very efficient, and in a way it is because they can actually harness all these different resources, all the companies, the military, the universities, everything works hand in hand to support a company like Huawei to achieve this kind of global dominance and you know quick push. How can we do something like that in the U.S. where you know? Obviously, we don't want to nationalize, uh, as you mentioned. How, how, do, how is that done? Oh, this is, this is a great question, and this is probably the key point. And the key point is what China figured out, what the totalitarian regime figured out, what Deng Xiaoping figured out, was that you have to align the private profit motive with your national interest. In other words, if you're doing well, the country's doing well. How do you do that? You structure the incentive system so you are... Uh, hyper enabled to do the things that make yourself wealthy as long as you don't challenge the Communist Party. And so it's just about structuring the system around that. And so they've done that. The financial in uh, incentives, the, the, the market pool from China are the two of the biggest um, levers that they have in this. And because of our connectivity to that system, as I already discussed, in the financial area, in the trade area, in the investment area, in the immigration area, in the, in the internet area, in the media area, they can also incentivize our own companies to be, um, to their private profit motive to be towards their national interests. Right. And so the answer really is if you are so hyper-connected to a country that doesn't uh, understand rule of law, doesn't understand private property, doesn't understand individual liberty, and doesn't understand sovereignty of the American people and the American nation, then you have to decouple. That's the only way that you can actually protect yourself. If you embrace China, you will lose. So what possibility then is there in ha having a trade agreement? What is this trade agreement gonna look like? Uh, well, before um, China made, we're not going to have a trade agreement now. It's not coming. It's not forthcoming. Okay. Um, and it's not going to be forthcoming. China is waiting on the 2020 elections. That's what the Communist Party has decided. When, before that decision was made, I expected we'd have a watered-down agreement that the president would basically assign, assign and then wait for the elections in 2020 and then turn around and, and, and say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna renegotiate this. That's not gonna happen either. So I don't think we're gonna have an agreement. I think it's all riding on the 2020 elections, who gets elected. Now, I don't care who gets elected, but what I want to have happen is that I want the American people to be protected. I want them to be protected in a way that preserves their freedoms. And whatever candidate does get elected, better understand that the most significant threat to our future prosperity and freedom is the Chinese Communist Party. Powerful place to end up. Uh, Rob Spaulding, such a pleasure. Thank you.